So I'm Clay Souza. I'm a wedding and portrait photographer in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and you're watching 808 with Clay here at Clay Souza Official. You are watching this either on Instagram or on YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel, Instagram, is the repository for every single post that we make. So at Clay Souza Official, we talk about light every Monday and Wednesday. I go live to talk about lighting. I actually, we talk about the three pillars of photography, which three pillars to an amazing photography which is lighting composition and posing always remember that posing goes hand in hand with directing okay so if you're watching us on youtube do us a favor subscribe to our channel uh we'd really appreciate your subscription and if you're watching this on instagram share this live with your friends so, so they can join us and learn about photography this is an open channel to anybody who wants to learn more about photography more 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 specifically flash photography and to all levels it is a safe space for you to ask any question that you have okay so tonight we have a really good topic we're going to talk about light intensity and lighting positioning so how much light you should put in your subjects and how do you separate your, your lighting from the background light and what's the uh, 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 and then when you get into light position where how do you position the light how you decide where to position your light right when you're shooting that's very very important because that's going to be a big uh, uh, part of, uh, of the success that I want you guys to have so last week we talked about we talked about uh, uh, how to uh, attract more clients in 2022 it was a live about like 30 plus minutes but I had an issue uploading that live to Instagram so the live is not an Instagram I upload six times and none of them went I was up until two in the morning try to upload the live for some reason the live didn't didn't go hey Mahendra um, so the live is uploaded on YouTube if you want to watch just go to YouTube and type Clay Souza official our channel will come up because we still don't have a URL official URL from YouTube we need at least a hundred subscribers there so as long as you're there if you jump to YouTube hit the subscribe button help us out to get that beautiful URL uh, uh, customize URL for us okay so but the live is over there from last week we talked about uh, how to get more clients into clients in 2022 all right so the live tonight is going to be about light intensity and light positioning right how much light you put in a subject how you separate your background from your foreground and also where to position the light to get started but before we go there like i do every week i want to start with the answering some questions i got a few questions this week and i picked three of them to answer here live with you because if somebody has a question maybe this is also uh one of your questions so uh, one of the questions that I have got, it's a really good one. Um, the question is, how do I avoid shadows hitting the wall when I'm shooting, on the background when I'm shooting? That's a great question. Uh, there are two ways of doing this. So one way, the easiest way, is to move your subject away from the wall. Move your subject away from the wall okay so the the, the the light will not travel and hit the wall that is the easiest way to do this uh, but there's another way to uh, say if you look at the inverse square law right so if you move your light closer to your subject you move your light closer to your subject so the light's not going to travel as far to hit the wall because you have to decrease if you move the light closer to your subject you have to decrease the power of the light so the less the less power the less it will travel okay so that will not hit the wall should not hit the wall okay so two ways of doing this one is to move the subject away from the wall and another one move the light closer to the wall so to um, closer to the subject I'm sorry closer to the subject so you can decrease the flash power and the light will not hit the fall off will be faster will not hit the wall okay that's and I know that's a little bit counterintuitive right the, the lights hitting the wall and you ask me to move closer to the wall yes because then you can decrease the power okay so that's number one number two what gear do I need to achieve great photos um, 
I, I don't know if it's a photographer thing, I don't know if it's just us, but we have this tendency of throwing gear on everything every time that we don't like our photos, right? We have this illusion that if I buy, if I, only if I had that camera, only if I had that lighting, only if I have those lenses, you know what? Gear is not going to make your photography go from point A to point B. What makes a photography go to point A to point B is education, is being here with us, so learning about photography, because photography is way more than gear. Gear is just a way to get there, but you need to know about lighting, you need to know about composition, you need to know about posing, you need to know a whole lot more uh, in order to be a successful photographer. You need to learn business, you need to learn how to sell, how to talk to people, how to book. You can have the most beautiful images, you can produce the most beautiful image ever, but if you can't sell, if you can't book, it's pointless, okay? Unless you're just doing landscape and, and birds and that type of stuff, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you are in business trying to sell, you need to be able to sell, you need to be able to talk to people. So there's a whole lot more to photography than just gear. So one of the things that I want to get guys get out of your head is you always need more gear. There's only so much gear that we can get. And you know what? What's going to happen is that I bet if you look at your camera bag or if you look at storage, you have a bunch of stuff that you don't use anymore. I mean, it is true. It's true with me. I have a few stuff that I don't use anymore. I was never really a, a gear head type of guy. I never bought a whole lot of gear. But I have like two or three soft box that I don't use anymore. Um, so at some point, we need to, to start putting money and time in our education. This is what it's all about. And coming here to this channel is a great way to do that because here I teach you based, not based on what's written somewhere, it's based on my, my experience as a seven year being a photographer, all right? And uh, 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 more than half of those seven years, I've been a wedding photographer. So it's a running a successful business for seven years and give you everything that I know about photography, okay? So, it's not about the gear, it's about the education, it's all about the creativity, okay? All right, cool. And then they have the third one, what's the difference between JPEG and RAW? That's a good question, keeps coming back and back over again. That's fine, we will answer the question again. So, JPEG and RAW. JPEG is a, when you shoot, when you shoot a camera in JPEG, the camera does some basic processing on your image to, and, and compresses the image size, okay? What happens when that compression happens, you lose data on the image, meaning a sometimes you cannot recover highlights, sometimes you cannot recover shadows, depending on how the camera compresses the image. Raw, as its own name says, it's raw image, there's no compressing, you get all the data that comes with it, right? And that's why I always advise people to shoot in raw, because in post-processing you, you have a way more latitude to, 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 to edit the image. Okay, so that's the basic difference between JPEG and RAW. And I'm not telling you not to shoot in JPEG. I'm telling you that you should be shooting in RAW, but JPEG will do it. Sometimes um, I know a, a lot of photographers who do like same day slide shows. So they shoot weddings and at the end, uh, uh, during the reception, they have a slide show of the picture they took and they shoot sometimes, and most of them have uh, a dual card camera. One card will record the JPEG version of the photo. Another card will record a RAW version of the photo. So they use the JPEG uh, a version to create a slideshow that is useful. Um, I mean, I I don't not I haven't done like the same day slideshow, but I've done like uh, uh, something that I used to do in the past for my brides. It's like I used to print a bunch of images from the wedding and deliver them at the end of the day, at the end of the night. So you'd bring a printer, and when the reception time started, so Danny, my wife, would go. 
uh, and download a bunch of images and do like a quick editing on them and we would put, put them on a little book and stuff and present the bride and groom at the end of the day, at the end of the night. So it would be a nice surprise for them. So that's one of the reasons to shoot JPEG. But if you're not doing any of that, stick with RAW. There's nothing wrong with RAW. There's no, I know there's some fear of people shooting RAW. I don't know why. It's the same thing as JPEG. It just gives you more control over how you edit and the image is a little bit flatter. So because it's a little bit more uh, flat than the JPEG because there's no processing. So you have to process the image. All right. So this is for the three questions now. Uh, and I hope this helped you a little bit if you have those questions. Okay, cool. So let's talk about lighting intensity. Okay, what's lighting intensity? Lighting intensity is the amount of light that your subject is getting, right? And when I'm talking about lighting intensity, I'm coming with the um, um, on the flash photographer perspective. All right. So you look. I'm I'm talking about this, not like the sunlight and on and on that. I'm talking about artificial light hitting a subject because you have control over the light. Right. So light intensity, the amount of light that uh, your subject gets when you're shooting, no matter which kind of flash it is, it could be a strobe, it could be a speed light. Right. The goal of having the subject lit, artificially lit, without looking like the, 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 the subject has been lit. OK, so um, um, basically what you want to do is to use flash but really uh, 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 in a way that people looking at the picture will not recognize that you use flash. That is the goal of flash photography, right? If, I mean, all right, let me do a parenthesis here. If that's the goal, uh, 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 if you're not shooting creatively, like, you know, hard shadows and things like that, right? If you want to go for a natural look, the goal is to, um, Use flash, but really not looking like use flash. The final image shouldn't look like use flash. Okay, um, flash, uh, uh, flash, strobe, they all are like uh, uh, daylight balance. So the light temperature on the flash is about 55, 5,000 to 5,500 K. Uh, Kelvins uh, in that case, which is a very white light. And white light is really not very flattering or not very natural to skin tones. All right. So that's why you need to be careful when you when you're thinking about light intensity. OK, how intense is the light in the subject? Because when we start photographing with flash, there's a lot of stuff that I need to be looking at. Right. And sometimes I've seen happens with, with probably most of the beginner uh, or even people who are making the transition from natural light into flash photography, they don't pay attention to the light intensity. You look at the, at the ambient light is one, one intensity and then you look at the, at, the, at the subject, the subject is white, it's pale because there's too much light in there. All right. So uh, and what's intimidating sometimes about flash is that um, flash is measured in fraction, right? It's like one half, one fourth, one thirty two, full power, one one. Uh, and I, I do believe that was a huge mistake that they made when whoever invented flash and decided, oh, let's measure this in fractions, like one four. Every time you talk in fractions, people tend to cringe a little bit because reminds you of math at school and algebra, all kind, all that kind of stuff that nobody wants to really to deal with if you don't have to, right? So what I tell people when they starting, when they when they mentor with me, when they starting is that don't think about those numbers. Those numbers don't mean anything. Okay, it's like either more power or less power. Of course, you need to know what those fractions like. Like uh, you need to know the. Uh, um, one half is more than one eighth. Okay, you need to know in order to move up and down. But all you're doing is really you're just moving light up, you move it down, you move intensity of the light up, intensity of the light down. That's what you're doing. Now, some of the some of the some of the of the um, some companies are now 
moving away from this fraction thing on the flash or strobe. Like the Profoto, for instance, the Profoto creates very, very good strobes and flashes. Very expensive though, but very, very good. And they don't deal with fractions anymore. It's like a scale from 1 to 10. 1 being the lowest power and 10 being the highest power. That I don't see the need for us to be memorizing um, Oh, it's one fourth power, or it's half power, or it's one eighth power. Guys, it's either more light or less light. It's pretty much this. You take the picture, you look at it. Too bright. Decrease the amount of light. Take another picture. Too dark. Increase the amount of light. That's simple as that. I I I I'm, I see a lot of photographers, especially beginners uh, or people moving from natural light into flash photography, get really hung up on those numbers. And I don't know what those numbers mean. You don't have to know. As long as you know that what's what's going up, what's going down, that's what you need to know, right? Because you, with digital photography, it's very different from the past when you took every time you push that button it would cost you money when you shoot film. Right, every time you push that button would cost us some money. So now with digital photography, it's not like that anymore. Just take a picture and look at it. It's very simple like that. And I know, I know, in the beginning is going to take you long. You have to be patient. It doesn't happen right away. Right? I remember uh, um, it was it was hard when I started, but once you start understanding the light and start reading the ambient light. It becomes second nature to you. It's really not that complicated. How are you doing? You're moving like more light or less light, right? Don't get hung up on those fractions. Don't get hung up on those numbers because that is just complicated things further. You don't have to do that. Just think about this. You're increasing light or you're decreasing light. That is pretty much it. Okay? So let me look at my notes here if I see anything, if I left anything off. Now we talk about the pro photos, we talk about, yeah. So your job as a flash photographer is really to master the light to a point where people will not know if you use flash or not, right? Unless you want people to know use flash, then that's different case. But if you're in a normal scenario, let's say you shoot a wedding or, or, or a high school senior or uh, an event, whatever it is, right? Family, um, and you use artificial light, uh, which is flash pretty much, okay? And when I say flash, I'm talking about any kind of flash. It could be the speed light, it could be the AD200, it could be a strobe, doesn't matter what. It's just like created light, right? So your job is to use that light in a way, in a manner that people will not know if you use light or not, okay? So layer, layer your background the way you've been telling you teach you how to do for, for some time now, darker background, lighter subject, and you'll be all right. Just keep an eye on the amount of light hitting your subject, because that's a giveaway that you use flash, and that's usually not good. All right? Cool. Now, if we talk about all of this, we need to talk a little bit about light positioning. Okay? Um, where where one of the key things when you talk about light position, lighting position is where you're going to put the light in, in reference to the subject, right? Where the light's going to go. It's going to go here, it's going to go to the side, it's going to go split light. This is when things get a little bit more, uh, um, not complicated, but needs a little bit more consideration. I keep saying this, it's important to have a game plan. It's important to get to know what you want before you start shooting, to know what the final result should be before we start shooting. Just think about this. How, how can I position my light if I don't know the outcome that I want? Okay? Um, because as you move the light, and you don't need to move the light a whole lot, you move the light a little bit and the, the light will hit the subject differently and this, the, 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 the results are going to be totally different. So that's why you need to know where you want to go before you even start. You have to have a game plan. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I have a game plan for every single time that I push the, the button. No, I don't. But 
I've been doing this for seven years. I know uh, what works and what doesn't work. Okay, that narrowed down my my options a whole lot. All right, and I know if I have time to push it uh, or, or to something very different, or if I'm in a tight timeline. For instance, uh, being a wedding photographer, being a wedding photographer, we always running and gunning a wedding day, right? There's not a whole lot of time for a lot of stuff. It's a long day, it's a stressful day, and you're also relying on other vendors to finish the work so you can start yours. For instance, this last wedding that we shot, hair and makeup finished 45, 40 to 45 minutes late. I mean, think about this, 40 to 45 minutes late, hair and makeup finish so that puts a huge dent on my day because now i have to spend the rest of the day tight trying to catch up on those timeline because you have a set of rules on a wedding that goes and not not everything can change so when i saw they were late over 30 minutes i went back to the planner and said hey hair and makeup is late they are late for now 30 35 minutes can we push the dinner for about 15 20 minutes so i can have more time with bride and groom portrait portraits and the answer was no we can't because it's going to be a, a served dinner and if we push it the food gets dry gets cold blah 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 blah, blah, blah. bottom line is no right so now i spent the rest of the day dealing with somebody being late okay so i have to catch up for the whole day because guys what happens is that if I don't shoot certain images, the bride's going to come to me and ask for the image. They're not going to go to the hair and makeup. People say, hey, you were late. My photographer didn't have time to do this. I need to come up with time, right? It's my job. So when you are in that situation, you don't have a whole lot of room to be like super creative with lighting, right? So you, you, you're going to go to your safest bet, the safest light, move fast, right? I get creative with posing at that point, but not really with lighting because we just do not have time in those type of situations, right? Uh, timeline became something that we don't know ends, but nobody really respects them. Uh, and, and photographers usually suffer the most with this because we are there the whole day and we need to catch up, all right? So, back into lighting position is you have to you should have a game plan uh, how do i want this light do i want a flat light do i want a split light do i want a, a rain brand light so you need to know your lighting patterns okay so we have a whole live on lighting patterns here so if you scroll uh through the feed you're gonna see we did like a live shooting here uh, downstairs in my living room where we show all the different lighting patterns how you move in the light and how they will affect uh, uh, uh the shadows all right so which which type of things you need to pay attention when you position your lighting okay when you position your lighting you should be a, pay attention to one thing like is there a lack of shadows on, on, on your pictures? This is a very common mistake, uh, of, especially from people who are moving from natural light into flash photography, because they want to light everything. Well, I mean, if you look at my face right now, my face is pretty well lit right now. There's no shadow. At the same time, there's no dimension to this. Shadows create dimensions. And when people move from natural light into flash photography, they always are scared of the shadows. They always try to kill all the shadows and create flat lighting, which is the safest light to create, but also the most boring one because there's no dimension to the face. There's no light. Everything is lit in one way. Okay, and one of the things that I say, actually, I say this because I do it, if you are in a pinch, if, you, if you're struggling with lighting the subject, if you are in a pinch, put the light in front of the subject and flat light the subject. That's going to be guaranteed good light, right? Boring, but good, okay? So if you need to move fast, sometimes you just have like one or two minutes to, to do a picture, boom, that's what you go for. Don't have time to be messing around with lighting, all right? So... If, you, if every picture that you take is lacking shadows, if you're using uh, artificial light, flash or strobe, and every picture that we take is missing, is missing shadows, there's an issue there. So you need to start moving the light to the side, a little bit to the side, because when you put the light to the front, that's what happens here. So I have, I have a, a beauty dish coming this way, a 
ring light, I'm sorry, the ring light coming this way, right looking at me, look what it's doing. And I have a, another light here that's just like a little bit of a fuel light, so there's no shadow at all on my face. Okay, so lack of shadow is one thing to look for. And on the shadow game, also, are the shadows falling where you want them to fall, right? Let's say, is your shadow here hitting the nose and what happens on the, on, on, on the, on the darker side here? Is it too dark? Is it not dark enough? What's the pattern that, 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 that the, the shadow from the nose is creating here over to the other side? Okay, so let's say the light is over here, so the light hits this side, the light's lit, so it hits the, the, the nose, and it's going to create some shadows here, all right? So look at that, make sure that it is what you want, look and adjust, right? Another thing to look for when you're doing flash photography is, are there any light spills? Is the light spilling where you don't want it to go? Is it spilling on the wall? Is it spilling on the ground? I mean, on, on the floor, that's an indication of a, 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 a lack of lighting control. Watch for those things when you are photographing. And I know it's a lot, especially if you're starting right now. I know it's a lot. And it takes time, right? I remember when I was starting, I'll tell you this, when I was starting, uh, I, I already started sh using flash. I never shot like only natural light. I use natural light when the light is good and the light is beautiful. I use natural light because I don't think there is such a thing, there should be such a thing as I'm a natural light photographer or I'm a flash photographer, right? Now, Light, light is the most important part of photography. Photography is light, and any type of light should be used. As long as it's beautiful, as long as it creates what you're after, it doesn't matter if it comes from the sun or if it comes from a, a strobe. Okay? So, but as photographers, I, I truly believe we need to master both of them. A lot of times I'm shooting, and I'm known for my, for my creative work with lighting, uh, but sometimes I'm shooting a wedding or something that, that we're shooting just like a ceremony, for instance, and the light is beautiful outside, I turn my flash off and shoot natural light because it's a beautiful light, all right? It doesn't give me a whole lot of, uh, of, of uh, latitude to work with it to create shadows and things like that, but it's beautiful light. During a wedding ceremony, I'm not going to stop and pose anybody. It's just photojournalism, so I use natural light every time that is, is available and it's beautiful and it works okay so there's no there shouldn't be such a thing like oh i'm a natural light photographer or i'm a flash photographer you know we if you are good if you want to make this into this this industry you should know both and you should know both very well okay so um and i know that this is this is this is tricky because there's a lot of it's a lot to look for. Uh, just here, I gave you like three things that you should be looking for when you're shooting. But you're shooting, you're directing, you interact with the client. How are you going to look at all of that? It will happen. It will happen with time. But you need to be aware of those things. And in the beginning, it's going to be hard. I'll, I'll tell you this: my shoots used to take like a, a family session, for instance. In the beginning, used to take like three to four hours. Honestly, three to four hours. Um, because I was experimenting with lighting a lot because I didn't have a good grasp on lighting. As I got more proficient with lighting, I can knock down a really, really solid uh, family shooting in one hour with like 60, 70 usable, very, very usable, nice, beautiful images. Because I, as I got better, as I, as I, uh, as I, uh, uh, um, I learned how to read the available light, it makes more easy for me to, to, to incorporate the creative light. I remember in the beginning, I used to do like, oh gosh, 10, 15 test shots. Today, probably I take like one or two shots. I have the light perfect the way I want. Let's move on and let's get it done. So this is not to tell you that I'm really good. It's just to show you it is possible and it will take time. You just need to stick with it, right? Don't fall into the easiest path. Because the easiest path is not going to take you where you, you deserve to go, right? We always want to go that extra mile, okay? So, 
when you when you position your light watch for this raccoon eyes right the black uh the dark shadows under the eyes the, the what what causes that is the light is too high the light's too high up here i can't even go like the light's too high up here right and the light the, the light will hit this part here uh of your eyes and will cast a shadow under the eye right this is called raccoon eyes what happens when you look at the image and you look at those raccoon eyes so there's too much um uh, too much uh, light uh, uh, under the eye is because the light is too high. Just lower that a little bit. All right. Same thing. Too much shadow under the chin here. Right. Too much shadow on this area. Same thing. The light is too high. Just lower the light a little bit. Or for that case here, the chin, you can bring a reflector under the subject like this. Right. And the light will bounce here and hit back the sheen and create some more light in here. You don't need to put like two flashes because the, that's probably one of the first reactions. I need to put a flash down up. You don't need that. Just bring a reflector. And I mean, I've done this even with like uh, a foam board, right? I had a foam board in the car. Just put it under the subject and the light will. Well, you're doing headshots. That's an easy, easy fix on a headshot. Almost every headshot that I have done. Uh, I'm always having the subject to uh, uh, either hold the light or I have the, the, the hold the um, reflector or I have a stand for the reflector that will bounce the light back on the sheen here. Okay, so um, we talked about that already. Light is spilling on the ground or on the floor. Okay, um, so what happens to that? The way to fix it, just feather the light a little bit. Let's say don't point the light directly into the subject. Feather the light up a little bit, all right, or to the side a little bit. If you feather to the side a little bit, you're gonna hit the oh my timer. Okay, if you feather this, let's say the subject's over here and your light is over here, right? If you hit the light solid into the subject, there's a lot of light coming in here. Okay, so if what you do to solve that, feather the light or to the side or to uh, or higher. Okay, so if you feather it to the side, so this edge of the soft box will hit your subject and you create a beautiful light to shadow uh, uh, um, a pattern there. And always remembering. There's no reason to be afraid of shadows because shadows create dimension. Look at my face right now. There's no dimension because I'm totally flat lit by my uh, ring light that's pointing to me. If I turn this light off here, one of them, let me turn the light off. So we can do a little testing, live testing here. So if I turn the light off, let's see how much light I'm going to lose. Not a whole lot because this guy is still pointing straight to me. All right? Look, let's see now. If I move this light to the side like this, you see I start getting a little bit more light to the side. Oh, there you go. I have a computer open. The screen is open here. That's creating just few light in here. All right? So as I move this to the side more and more and more, we start seeing a little bit of shadows over here. Right, because now I move my light to the side, okay, and that's what kind of what you want when you're creating those lights. So, see over here, what I'm doing here, I have two screens in front of me, two computer screens. So, here I have a little bit of shadow. Now, I turn the screen back to me. This is just a computer screen that is bringing this light close to me. See, just a little thing here. Look, when I have shadows, now I don't have shadows, all right, and if I move this light towards me again. Here you go. I'm flat lit again. Okay. So those little things that are going to create dimensions to the face. Shadows create the dimensions. So we need to stop being afraid of shadows and really embracing the shadows as we learn how to master lighting. Okay. Uh, there's one more thing that I want to talk about. Light is spilling on the background. We talked about that. Let me say this again. Two ways to deal with lighting spinning on the background. One is move the subject away from the background. All right, so that's the technique number one. Move the, the subject away from the background. Another technique is move the light closer to the subject because when you move the light closer, you can decrease the power and the light will not travel as far and hit the background. All right, this is the inver inverse square law. 
It's this thing that people make way more complicated than it needs to be. All right. It just means that your light, the, 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 the more power you have, the further your light will travel. Okay. So if you have the light far from the subject, you're going to need that light, be, let's say, full power. The light's going to hit the subject and just keep traveling, traveling, traveling. At some point, you'll fall off. So if it travels too much, it will hit your background and create this nasty shadow on the background. Nasty only if you don't want it. If that's your goal, congratulations. Uh, but if you move the light closer, you can cut this light in half or, or, or even more, like three-fourths, let's say. And so maybe we can use like one-fourth or one-eighth of a second there. The light will travel much less. Or you, the fall off will be much faster and will not hit the wall. All right? So this is a little bit of light theory for you today, uh, but this is how we started. We have to start at the basic. We can't just start over there and start putting lights up and shooting. No. First thing, just recapping quick here. First thing, first thing you need is have a game plan. Know what you want at the end. Know what the final image should look like. That's going to tell you where to put the light. Okay. Um, Try to avoid working with a lot of lights at the same time. So start with one light, dial the light. Let's say, let's say if you're going to use three lights, start with one, dial the light, everything's fine. Add another one, see how that second light is going to affect the first light. This is how I do this. When I'm working with multiple lights, that's how we do this, right? So we do one light at a time because one light will affect the other. Don't try to do everything at once because you probably going to fail and get disappointed and it's going to be much harder to be uh, to get where you want to go all right so there is a lot of talking uh it doesn't matter how much time i put in there i always go over um so i think that's all i have to, to, to for tonight Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate you being here every Monday and Wednesday to talk about photography with me. All right. This live is going to be definitely on YouTube, Instagram. Usually it's giving me a hard time with these long lives. I don't know what's happening there. I will try to upload it again tonight. Uh, if it doesn't work, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just go youtube.com and search Clay Souza Official, everything, one single word, no space, and you're going to get to our channel. There's a lot of good information there, Then some of this stuff that's in there is not on Instagram, all right? So, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate you. I hope this is useful to you. This was useful to you. This helps you with your photography. And, um, Adam, you just joined when we're leaving. And... Um, if you have any questions, do not hesitate. Send me a DM. I'm glad to answer your questions at any time that you need. If you want me to look at some images and critique them for you, if you want me to look at your website and critique it for you, let me know. I will gladly do that for you. Um, yeah, and tell your friends about our channel, about our channel, right? Thank you so much, guys, for coming. I appreciate it, and I will see you on Wednesday, when you get here at 8 08 p.m. Eastern Time to talk about flash photography. Bye.